24. Romans chapter number 7, verse 24, and then on into Romans chapter 8, through verse number 25. Beginning in verse 24, the Bible says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. But they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye live through the Spirit to mor- uh, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of Him who hath subject, subjected Him the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is not seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we have seen, for, for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Let's pray together, may we? Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your word and we thank you that it never returns unto you void. And Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture that we've seen uh, already this morning. We thank you for using the Apostle Paul in the way that you did. We pray now that you would speak to us through this writing, through your uh, revealed word today. We pray that you would open our hearts, that you'd help us to uh, understand exactly what we must do in order to live a life that is well-pleasing to you. Father, help us to understand the wonderful spiritual blessings that we have because of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For it's in His name we pray these things, and for His sake, Amen. Back in Romans chapter number 7, verses 24 and 25, uh, we understand immediately that the Apostle Paul was the individual, uh, the human being that God used to write this particular book. Uh, I like the Apostle Paul because the Apostle Paul understood his humanity. The The Apostle Paul understood how much of a A sinner he was uh, when put next to the uh, awesome holiness and glory of God. He understood what a what a wicked worm he was, and I and I dare say that 
If we had the privilege and opportunity of speaking to him, he would make it very clear, as he said to young Timothy, that I am the chief of sinners. Uh, And I think it would do well for each and every one of us to view ourselves in that way. That will help keep us humble. Understand that without Jesus Christ in my life, I am completely wretched and destitute and sentenced to a play, an eternity that the Bible refers to as hell. But thanks be to God for Jesus Christ who has delivered us from the wrath to come and has set us in heavenly places. Look at what he says in verse number 24 of chapter number 7. The Apostle Paul, uh, in all honesty and humility, says in this verse, O wretched man that I am. I understand who I am. I've seen the glory of God. I understand His holiness. And next to that, I am filthy. I am wicked. There is nothing that I can do within myself to please Him. I need the righteousness righteousness of Jesus Christ in my life on a daily basis in order to to live in a way that is well-pleasing to Him. He says, O wretched man that I am. I like the exclamation point that he puts at the end there. He's not simply making a statement. He's exaggerating this statement. Uh, I believe that he is uh, going above and beyond to not only indicate to himself, but the readers at Rome and each and every one of us today, that yes, without Christ, I am filthy. I am wicked. I am destitute. And each and every one of us should fully, completely understand that. Without Jesus Christ in your life, you have no hope. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus and said that. Without Him, we had no hope. We were dead, spiritually dead, until Jesus Christ saved us and resurrected us to new life. If you don't know Christ as your Savior this morning, I would strongly encourage you uh, to understand your need of a Savior. Understand that if you put your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ today, that's the best decision that you will ever, ever make make. Bar none. It doesn't matter who you marry. It doesn't matter what you do for work. It doesn't matter where you live. All of those things are completely irrelevant in light of you putting your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Until you do that, your life really spiritually has no meaning, no significance. You need Jesus Christ in your life. Trust Him today. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me From the body of this death. See, the Apostle Paul was a man that I like uh, for one reason, because he struggled with sin. I believe that the Apostle Paul uh, had things that he struggled with on a regular basis. And he mentions that in chapter number 7, near the end of the passage of Scripture. The things that I I know I should do, I I struggle to do them. And the things that I, I know I shouldn't do, those are the things that come naturally to me. He was an individual that had a sin nature, and he battled this on a somewhat regular basis. Folks, each and every one of us should understand that when we fall to sin, we're not alone. We should thank God for the opportunity we have to ask Him for His forgiveness. Whosoever, uh, the Bible says in the book of 1 John, that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and He's just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what we are prone to do many times as Christians? We fail. We sin against God. And what do we want to do? We want to, we want to feel guilty. We want to beat ourselves up. We want, to, we want to just stay down in the trenches and say, Oh, God can't use me because I've done this and because I've, I've done that. The Bible says that He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. If you confess your sin to God, if you as a Christian fail Him and say, Hey, you know what, God... In your presence, uh, I understand that this thing that I have done, this thought that I had, this action that I committed, uh, it's, it's sin. And I'm asking you to forgive me. The Bible says He's faithful and just to do so. And put you right back in fellowship with Him in the place that each and every one of us should have a desire to be. The Apostle Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I struggle with things from time to time. It's hard for me often time to overcome these things. I know uh, I have this pride in my life. I do things that I, that I know that I shouldn't do. Uh, and I fail to do the things that I know that I should do. And look what he says in verse number 25. He provides the answer to his own question. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God. He's the one who's provided deliverance. Notice how He's done it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Period. 
He says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God who's delivered me through Jesus Christ. It's nothing that I have done. I can't do enough good things to merit favor with God outside of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ, in His love for me, came to this earth, lived a perfect sinless life, fulfilled the law within Himself, bore my curse on the cross of Calvary, bled and died for me, so that if I put my faith and trust in Him, the Bible says that I am declared righteous, not because of anything that I have ever done, but because of what Jesus Christ done throughout the course of His life and the time that He spent on the cross of Calvary. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're here struggling with sin today, if you know Christ as your Savior, and you're struggling with some sort of sin in your life, understand that Jesus Christ is the one who can provide deliverance from that. Don't stand here and say, oh, this is just a vice in my life. I'm going to struggle with this until the day that I die. Jesus Christ, death on the cross of Calvary, provided victory over every sin and temptation that you will ever encounter throughout the course of your life. We have victory through Him. And that's what we're going to talk about. The three blessings that we have because of the salvation that we have through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice with me as the Bible begins in Romans chapter number 8, in verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Aren't you thankful for that verse? Aren't you thankful for what the Apostle Paul has just said? Now understand, these are words that God used the Apostle Paul to write. The Apostle Paul penned these words, but we understand that this is the complete, uh, inspired word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's His words. Paul simply wrote down the words that God gave him to write. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, complete, to do the things that God would have us to do. Serving Christ comes by changing our hearts and by changing our minds. Look at what the Bible says at the end of verse number 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. Circle that word mind in that particular passage of Scripture there. We live in a day and age when, uh, in, in Christian circles especially, we're encouraged oftentimes not to think too much. Okay, It's a scary thing. But each and every one of us, in our minds, we are to make a decision that we are going to serve God. As the Apostle Paul did here. That's why he said in the book of Romans in chapter number 12, turn over there very quickly with me if you would. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Okay? It only makes sense if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior... It only makes the only logical thing for you to do as a Christian is to present your life as a sacrifice to Him. Then in verse number 2, he says this, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind. Your thinking needs to change. You need to stop thinking on the things of this world. You need to stop thinking that that life is to please you. And you need to start transforming your mind and doing the things that are well-pleasing to God. Go back with me very quickly to Romans chapter number 8. He says, With my mind, I serve God. May God help each and every one of us today to make a conscious decision on a daily basis, to train our minds to serve Him and do the things that He wants us to do. That's why it's so important to have a great knowledge of the Word of God. Where do you store the information that you find and read in the Word of God? It's in your mind, okay? These are things that we must recall on a daily basis in the midst of us so that we can live in a way that is well pleasing to Him. Fix your minds on Christ. Fix your mind today on serving Him. Make the decision. Okay, with my mind, as the Apostle Paul said, I die daily. This is something that I have to do on a daily basis. Alright, the Apostle Paul was one of the greatest Christians that this world has ever known. Much better than me. 
Okay, I can't get up on, morning, on Monday morning and say, you know what? I am focused and I am determined. I am going to serve God. I made the decision in my mind. God, I am going to serve you this week. Help me to get through. It's not going to work. We must die daily and make a daily conscious decision. I am going to walk in His ways and I am going to please Him today. Not this week. I'm going to please Him today. Focus on today. God, help me. Give me the strength and power that I need to serve you. Uh, There are three blessings that we have through Jesus Christ. Our salvation brings us these things. Understand, if you don't know Christ as your Savior this morning, you don't have these things that I'm about to mention. Okay. On the contrary, you have the exact opposite. All right. Uh, number one, notice what the Apostle Paul is saying in verses 1 through 11 as we read just a couple of moments ago. The first great blessing that we have through salvation, which is in Jesus Christ, is life. Write that down. We have life through Jesus Christ. You might be here this morning and you say, well, I was alive before I ever knew Jesus Christ as my Savior. The Apostle Paul in this passage of Scripture isn't referring to physical life. You can be physically alive and spiritually dead. As a matter of fact, everybody in this room was until you put your faith and trust in Christ. Okay? The Bible makes it clear that when you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, an act of the mind and the heart, when you do this, the very first thing that is made available to us is life. And as the Apostle Paul says to the church at Galatia, life more abundant and free. It's a liberating thing to have your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Look at what he says. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Uh, the law of the Spirit uh, of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Uh, verse number 5, the Bible says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things after the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Uh, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity with God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Look at verse number 11. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He hath raised up Christ from the dead, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. You see, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, a perfect parallel to what I've just read here is Ephesians chapter number 2. Where the Bible says, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. We're now spiritually alive. Eternal life for me and for you who know Christ as your Savior is now an eternal possession. It, your eternal life is now a present possession that you have at this very moment in time. Keep your mind centered on the things of God. Turn with me over very quickly to Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3, again another passage that the Apostle Paul wrote, helping, to, uh, helping us to understand that we must keep our minds centered on the things of God. Chapter number 3, verses 1 through 4, the Bible says, if, then, if ye then be risen with Christ, in other words, if you know Christ as your Savior, if there's been a time in your life when you understood that you were a sinner and you put your faith and trust in Him, you asked Him to forgive you of your sin, you repented of your evil ways, and asked Him to save you, if that's true of you, seek those things which are above. The things of God should now be more important to you than the things of this earth. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. Uh, As Christ mentioned in the book of Matthew, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Okay? As Christians, our main focus, the, the uh, transforming of our mind, should be seeking uh, these things that are well-pleasing to God, living in a way that is well-pleasing to Him. And when we do that, we can understand that He'll provide us the things that we need. Okay? Sometimes as Christians, we have it backward. Uh, I've mentioned this before, what we tend to do, what we like to do, and I've even spoken to individuals uh, who have said this to me before, they've said, well, I'm waiting for my financial footing to be there, and then I'll begin to serve God uh, in a way that I know He wants to. Don't do that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. 
Do the things that He wants you to do, the things that His Spirit within you is giving you a desire to do. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. If you're right with God, and He's put a desire in your heart to serve Him and to do something, do those things, understanding that that is His will for your life, and all these things shall be added unto you. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that when you begin to serve God that He's going to give you mansions and and fast cars and, and lots of money. That's not what I'm trying to say. But understand this. When you are serving God the way that He wants you to, and you are seeking Him first in His righteousness, your desires are going to change, and you're not going to want those things anymore. You're going to be content with the things that God has put in your life. And understand this as well. Just because you are serving God doesn't mean you're going to live in poverty for the rest of your life. Okay? God has a way of blessing and taking care of His people. All right? Uh, That was a frustrating thing. I, I... uh, in college and seminary, there were individuals who said, well, I'm in the ministry, so I'll just have to get used to having nothing. That's not the case. God has blessed me and my family tremendously. And I thank Him for it and the things that He's given to us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness above your own wants and desires, and He'll provide the things to you that He puts in your life to have a desire for. Continuing on, go back to Romans chapter uh, number 8, very quickly if you would. Keep your mind centered on the things of God. Seek to please Him. Write this down. Seek to please Him on a daily basis. And then do this. Ask Him verbally if your life does. God, is my life pleasing to you? First of all, with the, uh, with the amount that I, that I put in the offering plate today. Is that something that is well pleasing to you? Uh, I feel as though this is the amount that you wanted me to give, uh, and I gave it, and I want to make sure that this is pleasing to you. By the way, when you start to ask these questions, God has a way of revealing to you if something is not pleasing to Him. Have you ever been there? Uh, Start asking yourself, God, are you pleased with the way that I dealt with my children today? God, are you pleased with the way that that I talk to my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in the church service today? Are you pleased with the way that I performed my duties at work today? Uh, Did I waste my time today? Was there something at, at, uh, at work? Did I respond to a co-worker in a way that wasn't pleasing to you? Here's a big one. God, are you pleased with the way that I dealt with my husband or wife today? Ask that question on a daily basis, okay? I do. And many times the Holy Spirit convicts me and says, you need to do things better tomorrow, okay? Hopefully He says that to each and every... We can always improve on the way that we behave for the honor and glory of God. God, is this thing that I'm about to do, would that be something that is well-pleasing to you? God, that thing that I just did, is that something that is well-pleasing to you? Did I honor you and did I glorify you? In the process, let's get in the habit of asking God, God, are you truly pleased with what I am doing? And as I mentioned just a moment ago, He has a way of indicating to us and telling us whether or not He's pleased with what we do. The first thing that He gives to us, according to verses 1 through 11, is life. New life, spiritual life, life more abundant and free. Not just physical life, eternal life that comes from knowing Him. The second thing, very quickly, is liberty. Look at verse number 12. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the second great blessing that is bestowed on you because of the finished work of Jesus Christ is liberty. Verse number 12, the Bible says, Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors. Uh, We are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We are free, we have liberty now, to refer to the God of the universe as my Father. The one who who loves me. The one who protects me. The one who meets my needs. The one who communes with me on a daily basis. Have you ever stopped and thought about your relationship uh, with God? Uh, I, I think oftentimes of uh, the president and his, and his family. 
What a great privilege and opportunity uh, the members of the president's family have. Any president throughout the course of uh, the existence of the United States, what a great privilege, uh, especially I think of, of George Bush and his daughters, the opportunity that they had to go and talk to him freely as a father. Uh, they had an opportunity that I could never ha- I've never, I have never seen one single president uh, in the uh, time that I've been alive in person, other than on, a, on camera, in, in person, I have never seen a president. And yet their family, their children, have the opportunity to walk right up to him. They have the opportunity to ask for, for money. They have the opportunity to ask for uh, advice. They have the opportunity to give them a hug. They have the opportunity to ask them for whatever they desire. But folks, just imagine, as, as awesome as that opportunity and privilege would be, We have that opportunity with the God of the universe. The one who created everything that we see. All matter, all space, all existence. He created it by simply speaking it forth. That's my Heavenly Father. That's the one who loves me. That's the one who I can go to for peace and for comfort and for joy and for blessing and for wisdom. All of these things. Are we taking advantage of this or are we taking it simply for granted? We have great liberty To come before God. Continuing on, look what the Bible says in verse number 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are called the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, look at what the next phrase says, joint heirs with who? Christ. You see, everything that is available to Jesus Christ is available to me. That's what being a joint heir is. Okay, my sister... Uh, and I, we have the, uh, we're joint heirs with my father's inheritance, okay? I'm, I'm hoping that he gives me his Jeep. Uh, but at the same time, <laughs> please, Dad, if you're watching, we're joint heirs. We have, he views us both the same. And at the same time, the way that God sees Jesus Christ. He sees each and every one of us the same way. Why? Because we're robed in His righteousness. When you put your faith and trust in Him, you are declared righteous. You are justified. The biblical term that we like to use, that means that you are declared righteous. Okay? Before God. God sees us as He sees His Son. The righteousness of Jesus Christ, the God-man, God now sees me that very same way. And everything that's available to Him is available to me. Are you getting this? Are you wrapping your minds around this tremendous blessing that we have because of the salvation that we have through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross? We're joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. We are freed from sin to please Him. That's the liberty that we have through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are now at liberty to please Him on a daily basis. Before you knew Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, as we sang this morning, the, Bible, uh, the song said that we were at enmity with Him. The Bible makes it perfectly clear that we are enemies of God before we put our faith and trust in Him. As soon as you put your faith and trust in Him, we are freed to now please Him. We are freed to go into His presence. We are freed to call Him our Heavenly Father. We are freed to ask for His grace, His wisdom, His help, His strength, His blessing. All of these things, when we have been freed to ask Him for the things that we need, and we are free to have a relationship with Him that He intended for us to have with Him before the fall of man. What a tremendous privilege. What a great blessing we have through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we have been born into His family. Understand that. Spiritually born into the family of God. When I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ so many years ago, I became a a citizen of heaven. As I've mentioned before, uh, on this earth, I am simply a, uh, a, a resident alien, if you will. I'm passing through. And some of you will look at me and say, yeah, you're an alien, all right. We are simply passing through. Okay, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through as we've as we sing many, many times. I am waiting to get to that celestial city, that's that city that we sang about, that beautiful city of God. 
I have been born into his family, and at the same time, I've been adopted into his family as well. How do you, how do you pair those two? I have been born spiritually into his family, and at the very moment that I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I was adopted into a, to an adult standing. When I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I became a baby Christian. I was born into his family, but at the same time, I didn't have to wait to grow, to get to the point where God sees me the same way that He sees His Son. Does that make sense? I have been adopted into that spiritual standing. Born into His family, I need to grow. I need to grow spiritual. I need to progress. I need to be sanctified. That's what that term means. Progress in our spiritual life. But at the same time, I've been adopted into His family as well, meaning that I have this adult standing with Him, the same standing that His Son, Jesus Christ, has before Him. Folks, what a tremendous... What a tremendous blessing that is. Our salvation brings us life. Our salvation brings us liberty. And the third thing that I want to look at very quickly is our salvation brings us hope. Our salvation brings us hope. Look at verse number 18 through 25. The Bible says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected him the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Folks, what the Apostle Paul is saying here is we have great confidence that everything the Bible says is available to us is actually going to happen. We can trust uh, what the Bible says with regard to what happens to me after I die or when Jesus Christ comes in the cloud for His, for his bride. Uh, because of this, write these couple of things down and I'm going to close in just a couple of moments. Because of the hope that we have, we need to understand this. We must not be upset by the events of this world. You say, Pastor, that's, that's easy for you to say standing up there. But I've got some things going on in my life and it just seems like, wow, this is, this is too much for me to bear. I don't understand why I'm going through this. And at the same time, I can say the same to you. There are things in my life that you folks may not understand. Uh, there are some things in my life that I have great need of. Uh, some health situations, some family situations, all of these things. We all have... We all have needs within our, within our own hearts and within our own lives. But we look at this passage of Scripture, and the Bible makes it perfectly clear that we should not be upset by the things that are going on in our lives, and we should not be upset by the things that are going on in this world. Why? Pastor, how can you say that? Because it can't even compare to the glory that awaits us when Jesus Christ comes back in the clouds. Folks, what a wonderful day that will be. The Bible says that, that His creature is yearning. There's this great expectation. It's as if we're looking, we're stretching forth our necks, trying to see what is next. That's how each and every one of us should be within our own, within our own spirits, within our own hearts, on a daily basis. Folks, the things that we're going through right now, to be honest with you, when we're in glory, they will completely be forgotten. We'll have no remembrance of them. If you come on Wednesday nights, which I hope, uh, I hope we get in the process of doing, you'll understand these things. By the way, we're about ready on Wednesday nights. I'm just going to throw this little commercial in there. Uh, we're, we're about ready to begin speaking about the Millennial Kingdom. We're about ready to begin speaking about heaven proper. I don't, we need to understand there's more than just heaven and there's more than just hell. Okay? What is heaven proper? What are we going to be able to do? Come on Wednesday nights and you'll find it. It's, I'm looking, when I study this and find it out, I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward to it now even more. And I'm not going to get into it because I want you to come on Wednesday night. Do my best to get you here. We must not be upset by the events of this world. Folks, understand that one day we will be with Him and nothing will compare to the glory of eternal fellowship with God. Whatever you're going through today, whatever you're facing right now, understand that, hey, you know what? God has allowed it into my life 
for a specific purpose. I know that we've heard this before. I know oftentimes it may seem cliche, but it's something that we must grasp with our minds and allow us, and allow us to be transformed because of the knowledge of it. He has a reason for it. And it's for His honor and for His glory. The things that we are going through are going to seem like they're going to vanish in a moment when we see Jesus Christ when He comes in the clouds. Don't be upset at what's going on in our country. As hard as it is not to be, don't be upset because God has it all under control. God has a plan. He has a purpose. And, be, and as bad as it gets, He's going to receive even more honor and glory for it. Understand that and trust it on a daily basis. We have great hope because of the salvation that has been brought to us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't be discouraged by the things of this world. Fix your mind around this hope. That one day I will be in glory with Him. One day all of the things that I am going through right now, they're going to be vanished away and I'm going to be in glory with Him. My loved ones that I have lost and I'm, that I'm missing at this very moment, I am going to be in glory with them. I am going to be able to, to fellowship with them for all of eternity. Why? Because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ paid on the cross of Calvary so many years ago. Because of that, we have life. Life more abundant and free. Because of that, we have liberty to go to Him, to call Him our Father. And because of that, we have hope. Confidence in the truth of His Word that the glories that await us can't even compare to the suffering that we go through in this present time. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Has there ever been a time in your life when you've put your faith and trust in Him, understanding that you are a sinner, and without Him you will die and go to a place that the Bible refers to as hell? But He never intended for you to go there. The Bible says that if you put your faith and trust in Him, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. You might be here this morning and say, Pastor, you don't know the things that I've done. You don't know the things that I've done. Jesus Christ saved me. He can save you as well. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not my words. It's God's words. God is truth. And you can trust Him. Will you be saved today? Christian, are you living in light of the things that we have just seen? Is there tremendous joy and peace and blessing in your life from realizing that we have life, we have liberty, and we have hope? May God help each and every one of us to have our minds transformed and think on these things daily, to live in a way that is well-pleasing to Him and get everything out of our salvation that He intended for us to have. You see, in closing, I don't think that Jesus Christ died on the cross so that we would live a mediocre existence and just every once in a while have peace and joy and blessing. I think He intended for us to have that on a daily, moment-by-moment basis. May God help each and every one of us to have our minds renewed on a daily basis in order to live in a way that is well-pleasing to Him as we die to ourselves. Let's pray together, may we? Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for loving us. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture that we've seen this morning. We pray that you'd speak to the hearts of your people. Lord, we pray that if there's one among us today that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that you would even now speak to their heart. Help them, Father, to be miserable until they come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Father, I pray that you'd help them to understand their need of a Savior. And I pray that you'd help them to call upon you. Father, for the Christian here today, we pray that you'd help each and every one of us to live in light of the things that we've seen today. Father, because of Jesus Christ and His death on the cross of Calvary, You have given to us life, liberty, and hope. Moment by moment, Father, I pray that You'd help us to live in light of these things. Help us to get as much out of our salvation as we possibly can. Help us to never take these things for granted. And we'll thank You for it. We love You. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Let's all.